I've still got one of the bullets that got in, so um, armored cars are not impregnable. We got backed up behind some American Humvees, and in those days, uh, they would shoot at you. And I'm terrified. You're, you're, you're not selling this to me, mate. The problem is, the curve of the bonnet and the curve of the roof are the same shape as an aeroplane wing. You just sleep on top of the turret. Nick, how are you, brother? Hello, Chris. How do you do? Right, good to see you. Yes, thanks for coming on the show. That's all right. Pleasure to be along. Yeah, we've got to thank Matt. Hello, Matt. If you, if no yep. doubt, you'll be watching this at some point for putting us in touch. And um, Matt said you've got to meet this guy, Chris. He's he he basically be the most fasc fascinating guy you know. So I always like a, a bit of a heads up, personal recommendation. All right, so hope, hopefully I'll, I'll you know, uh, live up to the mark, as it were, you know. I'm sure you will. <laughs> so um, let's go straight in at the deep end, then. What, what, what's it like being in a tank? Um, people talk about claustrophobia. Uh, I never found it. Uh, I never found anyone else in an armoured vehicle who suffered from claustrophobia, because you tend to hope not, wouldn't you? But bearing in the amount of people that actually just joined the army in the first place and joined an armoured unit, having never been in one, it would be logical to think that there'll be some sort of attrition somewhere where people say, I can't cope with the confined space. It's not true. It doesn't happen. Although unlike a submarine, you can get out of a tank, right? but you can't you know, with a submarine, of course. Now, the um, when I first got into it by doing an army cadet visit to the Queen's Dream Guards, a Welsh cavalry regiment, uh, as an army cadet, and that would have been in the sort of early early 70s sort of thing, you know. Uh, they did light armour, but I liked the idea that they had something which was very, very mechanical, a uh, real proper machinery type thing, but they were frontline soldiers as opposed to being in the Remi or, or somewhere else that was more of a support arm sort of thing. But when I joined, I wanted to join an armoured unit that recruited from my area, the southwest. So I joined the Third World Tank Regiment and they were equipped with, at that particular time, Chieftain Battle Tanks. Uh, Chieftain Battle Tank, uh, quite a large bit of kit. You're talking about 60 odd tons in weight, uh, somewhere in the region of 35 feet in length, about 12 foot high uh, and so on. All right. By Cold War standards at the time, very modern bit of kit. We look back on it now saying not quite so. So in terms of what's it like to be in a tank, well, first of all, you've got to consider the, the crew. So you've got a driver who sits centrally at the front, right, in the bottom half, and then the turret crew, being the gunner, the loader, who also does the signals, and the commander, all sit up in the turret. So you've got to separate the, the two halves out, because when the vehicle is moving, the, it will go whichever way it needs to go to get from A to B. But the turret crew will at the same time say, well, we've got arcs from over there, to over there so the, the two bits sort of operate independently all right so the driver is effectively like the, the, the lancaster bomber tail gunner you can't see him and he's just at the end of the intercom all right and all this is thundering along um now the idea of a tank just to sort of break away from what it's like on the inside uh because people see things on tv about tanks sort of sat in fields just slowly shelling villages and stuff like that but that's not the idea all right a tank works as part of a team and the best way of thinking about it is a tank is like a rugby player, all right? It's quite a big bit of kit, and there's a lot of strength and energy there, all right? But a rugby player is part of a team. And if you can imagine a rugby team going around town on a Friday night, and they find a good pub, all right, get in amongst it all, trash the place, all right? And then they pull out of it, all right? And they go across town, and they can find another pub, and they go and trash that instead, all right? And they pull out of that and go somewhere else. So you're talking formations of armour, highly mobile, all linked by uh, good communications, like with good tactics, uh, good navigational skills, no satellite in those days, all right? Acting as a cohesive unit who literally deliver the punch to the enemy. So you've got a 120 mil rifle barrel as it, it was in those days. You can either fire high explosive squash head at them, all right? You've got two machine guns on there, 762 GPMGs, all right? But we've also got a nature ammunition called APDS, or Armored Piercing Discarding Sabo, all right? Now, an APDS round works on kinetic energy, just like a standard bullet out of a rifle. All right? But uh, an APDS round, the middle bit is about 
that diameter by about that long. It's got a casing around it to make up the 120 millimeter barrel. That flies down the barrel, I think it's about 1,300 and something meters a second from, from memory. The casing falls off and then you get this round bit by that, that, that long flying through the air made of uh, tungsten, or right, a hell of a weight to it at 1,300 meters a second. And it will literally knock the turret off the enemy vehicle, the whole lot. All right, it will just take it clean off. All right, or if sufficient resistance to the ammunition, it will literally punch a hole through the front of the tank that's just hit, pass through the driver, through the turret, through the engine, through the gearbox, and back out the other side again. So utter destruction. You know, but that's what a tank does. It's taking that using mobility and um, good communication and good tactics, all right, as a team to go and start punching things on the battlefield as a group. So awesome, awesome bit of kit. Where do but, you sleep when you're tank crew? Um, never underneath it. Lots of stories dating back years ago about sleeping under tanks. No, no one does, all right, because if, the th if it sinks overnight, you're, you're stuck. Um, so it's all to do with your tactical situation, Chris, really. Um, quite often, you just, you just sleep on top of the turret or you sleep on the engine decks with it. They're nice and warm. That said, they, they go cold within about an hour. Um, and, of course, it's all hard steel. It's not really all that good for a good night's sleep. So sleep on the ground. Um, so tank crews, like any else, issue with bivy banks, Gore-Tex, um, and you literally sleep rough. All right. So it's not all as comfortable as people might think. Trying to sleep inside a tank is actually a nightmare. If anyone's tried to sleep inside a car before. So you just sleep outside uh, and you just take the weather that goes with it. And bearing in mind that we used to do all our exercise in northern Germany in February, you, know, you were just sleeping out on the ground in a sleeping bag and a, a bivy bag in, in minus 10, minus 15. You know, but we were young and uh, that's the way you did it. So if you could, you slept on the back for a warm night or a warm couple of hours. Uh, but generally speaking, you're on the deck, you know. And you and how, how cramped are they, Nick? I, I didn't think they were, really. Um, I suppose some people might be surprised. The, the driver, for example. So, you know, sitting sitting sentry at the front with his head out the top sort of thing, you know, without getting chopped off by the, by the turret. All right. But you could actually drop the whole thing down and re recline. There's enough room in there to, to move around like that. You know, so that's something fine. You can reach left and right to all the stuff that you've got stored in there. Uh, when you get into the turret, though, um, the commander, right, would sit on the right hand side as you would be stood on the tank. So, you know, same as the right hand side of a car. Okay. All right. Lots of room. All right. Head out the top if you need to. Close down. Lots of sights. Lots of vision. But the gunner sits between his legs. All right. The gunner, the gunner's head is actually between the commander's knees. <laughs> all right. And then you've got the, the gun has got the breech on his left hand side as well. So as you're traveling along cross country and the gun's stabilized, the, the breech is effectively moving up and down next to the gunner. So you, the gunner actually hasn't got an awful lot of room. He's got a, a sight just there. Um, and then sort of when you want to challenge a one and challenge a two, you've got sort of thermal imagery screens and stuff like that. He can't do much. All right. He's actually quite cramped in there. And the gunner just spend eight hours a day, you know, when you're in on maneuvers and stuff, right, inside there. You know, they get in in the, in the morning, first thing in the morning when it's still dark, all right, and then they potentially wouldn't get out until, guess what, it was dark, you know. On the other side of the turret, you've got the, the loader who loads all the ammunition for the main armament, all right, he does the, uh, the factory mounted machine guns, 762 GPMG, does all the signals and radio stuff. He's got more room, all right, he's got a whole half of the turret for himself, effectively, but when you're firing, that breach is 35 and a half inches backwards, all right, so you... You can't go behind there, obviously. Also, when the turret's going round and round, all right, the loader sits on the upper half of the, of the turret, so he goes round and round with it. The turret floor down at the bottom, if he stands up, that goes round and round, but all the bits in between don't, all right? So on the loader's side, you've got bits of it that go round and bits of it that don't. So you've got this going on all the time. So if you put your hands and your legs in the wrong place, you're going to lose something. Um, and people did every now and again, and it you know, got an arm caught or something like that. And when the commander pressed the button on the radio to sort of you know send send out the call, you could hear the screaming in the background. 25, 30 tons of turret does not stop for no, you know, doesn't stop any man whatsoever. All right. So don't remember hearing any horrific injuries, not really, uh, which is testament to the bloat, I suppose. Uh, but it's big machinery stuff, Chris. And if you get in the way of it, it hurts, mate. It really hurts, you know. I'm claustrophobic, I'm dizzy, and I'm terrified. You're, you're, you're not selling this to me, mate. 
you'd be fine. You'd be fine, you know. Um, the, the other thing is, especially for the loader, all right, when you're going cross-country and closed down, all right, so you've got the, all the hatches back and shut sort of thing, you know, um, the loader can't really see out that much, to be perfectly honest. And you're literally hanging on to handles on the, on the turret roof like that, so things crashing around. And you've got the breach going up and down like this, and you try not to get thrown over the breach because... If that goes like that against the roof and your head's in the way, well, that's going to be curtains as well. So, um, yeah, it's a very aggressive environment in there. Uh, but when you start loading main arm and ammunition up there and that gun starts going, I tell you, there is nothing like it. All right. And, and you know that what you're training for is the kill at the other end. All right. Bang. All right. 120 millimeters right down the bloody barrel. All right. And start knocking people out. It's mega. Mm. You know, proper, proper stuff. What's the potential then for actual? combat uh right now not so much although i'd say with ukraine on the boil at the moment all right that could that could all go in all sorts of, of directions all right uh but if we take ukraine out of the equation um at the moment um on a challenger two as a british army i have um not so much actually on the challenger unless you go and re-roll and go and do something else my era was very much back in the cold war so i was sort of 1980s right through to 2000 so uh, certainly the 1980s saw all that sort of big standoff in in what was west germany and east germany and the warsaw pact uh, and that if that had kicked off that would have been ferocious that would have been absolutely ferocious and that's what the whole thing was about and that's why the british army were in germany at that time um, that would have kicked off big style. All right. So for people who aren't overly familiar with the Cold War, yeah, worth looking at because that was what it was all about. And some fascinating stories from that period. You know, that that would have been proper tank on tank. Yes, I'm I'm just picturing the lie of the landscape because now the British Army is all orientated towards this future soldier initiative. So uh, looks like defending the Suez Canal from rebels in African rebels, basically. And of course, that's all. That's why we're. It's all going towards being highly mobile and technological and and. Uh, yeah, well, what what there was, Chris, is if, uh, I mean the Cold War because it was everyone just it's like two sides just sat facing each other. All right. Um, ultimate superpower stuff. So the Americans and the Russians, of course. And you could almost say that despite the fact it was potentially massive, all right, but at the same time, there was more peace in the world then because effectively the Americans controlled one half of the world all right, and the Russians controlled the other half. Okay, So even if a small country in Africa somewhere started kicking off, they were so heavily un uh, influenced by the, either the Russians or the Americans who just picked the phone up and said, just shut up because you're going to start something off, all right? And the whole thing was just bolted down there and then. So incredibly, despite all this nuclear missiles and all the rest of the sort of stuff that was all stacked up on both sides, all facing each other, underneath all that, it was actually relatively calm right across the world because everything was just bolted down. What you've got now, the Berlin Wall came down and everything's sort of fragmented and, and you know, China's sort of started you know, becoming very big and, and so on. But no one's got massive control of all these countries anymore. They've all fractured and all gone their own way. So they're all kicking off with all these minor different insurgency um, uh, uh, operations. Now, there was um, a certain equation I came across at one stage, and it's something along the lines of for every, every month that a, a situation uh, lasts for can take a year to then go and sort out. All right. Um, I remember a big British Army defence review uh, sort of back in sort of, you know, late 2000, looking at just that issue. All right. So if you want to, if you want to these days to be nailed down pretty quickly, you've got to be a real rack quickly before it, it takes foot. All right. Um, now, I know we've gone through Afghanistan and Iraq and they, they both took horrendous amounts of years to, to sort out. And I'm not convinced we haven't really sorted it out, to be honest. Um, but if you look at all this other minor stuff that goes on around the world, if you can get someone there quick, and you can nail it down quick, then it'll stop it from becoming a big, long, protracted war, which nobody wants at all. You know. Yes. And What's you've done the, private security work, Nick, in, in the Middle East. Absolutely, indeed. No. Um, that was unique in its own right as well, Chris, because uh, that was all to do with having left the army in 2002, took a year out to wander across uh, West Africa and Land Rover. Um, and at that stage, it sort of coincided with Gulf War II and the aftermath 
of Gulf War II. And what actually happened was the Americans, or you know, the, the Allies, not the Allies, but you know, the, the everyone else hadn't really put a plan in place for what happened after the war. Okay. Now Iraq at that stage was 30 years behind. Now it wasn't just 30 years behind in technology, but it was 30 behind, years behind in education. It was 30 behind, years behind in infrastructure, in, in how the electricity was generated, um, social security systems, banking, business, and all that. It was all way, way, way behind. So what the Americans had to do was then start bringing in private companies who were experts in, in social welfare, in banking and business, and that sort of stuff, to come and start rebuilding Iraq to make it a modern-day country. And they, in turn, needed security to get them from A to B and around because the American military and all the other military organizations weren't there for that reason. And they didn't have the manpower either. There's no way that they could cope with that amount of work. So what was really a very small sort of security industry at that stage suddenly grew very rapidly overnight from about really late 2003 onwards. All right. I mean, when you get 2003 to four, it started going like that. So a lot of new companies started. Uh, a lot of existing companies got very big, very quick. Um, I was kicking my heels at that stage. I think a year, a year in Africa was, was enough. Uh, so I decided to come home, didn't have a job. Let's go and use some soldiering skills, but an adventure anyway. Um, and by hook and by crook, I uh, managed to get myself onto a, a contract in central Baghdad. Now, the company we were looking after, uh, they wanted to go out into central Baghdad every day, uh, bar sort of, you know, Friday, effectively, uh, to do a lot of um, banking business restructuring. Uh, the approach that we took was rather than go out in quite um, obvious to see um, armoured vehicles, jeeps, um, four by fours, that sort of stuff, we took an opposite approach. Um, we grew beards, we dressed down, we got into BMWs, we hung things off the mirrors, we put fur across your dashboard because that's what everyone else did. We looked at what everyone else looked like and we tried to look like them. Now, I'm not saying that we wouldn't call it covert and there's no way on earth that a person like me is ever going to look like somebody from the Middle East. But the whole idea was, was by softening the way that you looked, was it took a second glance to see you. So we used to go out with two cars uh, with two clients, we have two guys in the front, two guys in the in the rear car, two clients in there, and we just melt through Baghdad in a very fluid, easy sort of way and blend into the traffic, and we just just sink into the into the background, uh, and that's how we got from A to B. So highly vulnerable because we were only four guys at the end of the day, uh, armed with an M4 assault rifle each and a, and a Glock pistol. Um, cars for a long time weren't even armoured either. All right, we were just four guys in Baghdad traffic with, with two clients, and we stayed that way for a long time. It was it was good. It was good, actually. So tell us some hair-raising moments, and um, <clears throat> don't spare the horses. Yeah, certainly. Um, they're sad because the hair-raising moments, by being hair-raising moments, tend to be very, very saddening and, and tragic uh, cases and they were, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, Chris. You go out there earning that sort of money. You, someone pays somewhere. Um, one incident I was involved in, it was, it was the Biap Road. It stood for Baghdad International Airport Road and it was about, from memory, about 10 k's of dual carriageway. Uh, and the Biap Road connected the international zone where the Americans, the Brits and everyone else lived and it connected it all right, out to Baghdad International Airport. And um, and when you left the green zone, the international zone, that bit of dual carriageway just became a free-for-all. And the insurgents uh, decided to, to put a, we call it a bullet in, but they made it known that they were going to turn that place into the most dangerous bit of road in the world, which they did. All right. Um, so you've got all the usual Baghdad traffic down there, all the people that live in those areas, they're all going up and down the dual carriageway, just like you'd expect anywhere else in the world, and we were in the middle of it. Um, and on one occasion, um, we came out of the international airport. We were getting close to the international zone. We were in four by fours at that time, which fortunately were armored. Uh, very, very fortunate, actually. The lead car was about 100 yards ahead of us. Um, I was the team two IC, sat in the passenger seat in the right hand seat. And uh, the chat was with a driver, a fellow called Pat, ex paratrooper said, Nick, there's a car on the inside lane and it's, it's got the windows open. 
you know, and it's February, it's a bit cold, you know. So a bit of a combat indicator. So as we overtook it, we looked, and I looked inside the car, and there was nothing untoward, and I said, it, it seemed fine, Pat, you know, so we, we carried on. And, um, and then as we got to sort of junction in the, in the dual carriageway, where we went that way to the left and over the top into the international zone, the, the, the road also branched off and went south towards Basra and places like that. And at that moment, the whole world just went mad. All right. Now, you know, when you're driving in your car and a stone hits the windscreen, that sharp crack you get when a pebble hits the, hit the windscreen of your car. If you think about something else, you zoned out somewhere else, it actually can be quite frightening. It's just the shock of the noise, the impact. Well, if you times that amount of volume by 10, and then times that by 28 rounds from a Kalashnikov AK-47. That's what it's like. All right. So effectively, the car that we looked at had had someone in the back seat. They suddenly accelerated down the inside lane past us because they could make their getaway to go, go south. And they just loosed off the whole magazine from an AK-47 out of the back of this car straight into the side of our car, fortunately being armoured. All right. Um, I'll be honest, Chris. Um, I mean, the whole just world just went just went noisy, all right? And I found myself in the passenger footwell, all right? You just open your eyes and you think, crikey, what the hell's going on? And sort of get back up again and, and shake yourself out because your instant reaction anywhere in the world is it's, it's a duck, all right? Um, by that stage, the car had gone, but we'd now taken so many rounds in the car um, that they, they have two flat tyres, the engine management system had been taken out because the, I think the bonnet is not armoured, of course, and we rolled to a halt, all right, and I was shouting at Pat saying, watch the lamppost, watch the lamppost, because we were slowing down from about 80 k's an hour. We were heading towards this lamppost in the central reservation, you know, and the car wasn't easy to control because the power steering's gone, the tyres are flat and so on. So we managed to miss this lamppost and we pulled over uh, and got into amongst a scrub in the, the centre of the dual carriage line. The problem was then, though, that the Bayat Road was also notorious for suicide car bombs. Um, so the insurgency would literally have people in, in cars driving up and down the bike road right, in a fully loaded suicide bomb car ready to go, just looking for a target. And all of a sudden, we'd gone from having survived 28 rounds, I came to the bullet holes later, 28 rounds from a Kalashnikov AK-47 at almost point-blank range to being a sitting target for a, a suicide car bomber. All right, and there's really not an awful lot we could do either. So uh, we managed to sort of, we couldn't even get hold of the other team members on the radio because they they just cracked on. They just went out of radio range. It wasn't great for comms there anyway. So we were bomb burst out of the car uh, and we're now thinking, well, we need to get back to the green zone. And uh, we're now a sitting duck for a suicide car bomb. So we just got away with one attack and we're now waiting for, waiting for the next, you know. Um, I've still got the pictures. Uh, I've still got one of the bullets that got in. So um, armoured cars are not impregnable by... Any standard, all right. It was uh, one of the rounds I got in was a was a proper armor piercing seven point six two rounds. Got a little tiny cylinder of whatever it might be in tungsten or something on the inside, uh, and actually got in through a door jam. Did a complete couple of loops around the inside of the car, took all the roof lining out and all the rest of it. Left the inside of the car shredded, um, and I still got it. Just one of those mementos of one of the things that happened in Baghdad. You know, that's one. That's one. I can relate to, relate to a couple more if you like. Yeah, did you did you lose anyone? Not not on that occasion. Not on that occasion, Chris. Um, but it wasn't wasn't long after that. Actually, we're on the same rotation. We used to go in country for about eight weeks at a time. So still on that same rotation. Um, and the car in front was a, a fellow called Jolly Dolman, ex paratrooper, brilliant bloke. And he remains this, this day to be be just such an inspiration to me. Uh, a fellow called Nick uh, Pease, uh, ex French Foreign Legion chap from Hamel Hempstead. All right, Tracy Cushing and John Erdley, all right, who were the two clients from the company we looked after. Lovely, lovely people. Um, again, we've been to the airport and we're on the way back. And when we came out of the airport, we were with an awful lot of security teams because everyone had gone to the airport to pick up all the people off the flight. And by virtue of that, you've got all these people all now trying to leave the airport or trying to get the, the international zone. So... We, we made the decision was let's get to the front of the pack so we can try and break away so we, we don't become part of that center of mass. We don't want to be part of that, that big group, which makes a big, easy target. That's the psychology behind it, which I think in, in hindsight was still a very reasonable shout, to be honest. We got backed up behind some American Humvees. And in those days, uh, they would shoot at you um, if you 
got too close because they were had problems with suicide car bombs as well. They didn't always recognise us, Chris, either. We're just four guys sat in two BMW cars at the end of the day. In fact, it was two four by fours. But we were in civilian vehicles, all right? So everyone was backed up behind these these uh, American Humvees. And eventually they peeled off. And then we said, right, let's go. So off down the Bayat Road towards the international zone. Um, because of the earlier incident, I've just recounted about the drive-by shooting. I happened to be looking over my shoulder like that because of the slip road that had gone off south of Basra. Uh, and as I've done that, there was a, a bang, like when you stick a pin into a balloon. All right, that's what an explosion sounds like when you're really, really close for anybody who's Who's, who's not and you know, fortunately hasn't done. But it's like a pin going into a balloon right next to your ear. All right, it's such a sharp crack. As I look forward, everything was black. And at that stage, I thought, crikey, it's us. And why doesn't it hurt? Because all the indications are there. It's, it's us. Mm-hmm. You know? And all of a sudden, this, this cloud just disappeared like that. And it was literally like driving out of a bank of fog. And it was just open road. And I remember looking in front of me going, crikey, where's John and Nick gone? And then it dawned. It was them that had got hit by the bomb. And what it was, it was two cars had come the other way up the dual carriageway, the wrong way against the traffic, which was completely normal in those days, right? Because traffic was just bonkers and then what it did. That forced them to the outside lane to take, to avoid these cars coming this way, which were effectively nothing to do with it, to be honest. But as they went into the outside lane, all right, there's a suicide car bomb sat in the center reservation. All right, and the moment where they went past, boom, and off it went. Um, Pat, uh, who I was was still with, uh, and we're still very good mates now as well, Um, Pat actually saw a six-ton armoured land cruiser physically leave the road, literally get get blown into the air with the doors coming open and that sort of stuff, over the side of the the flyover, all right, uh, and then land on its roof uh, in flames down on the ground. So we stopped. All the traffic behind us just came screaming to a halt and turned around and just disappeared, right? Which left Pat and I effectively in this in this car uh, with all the all the shrapnel and all the rest of bits of engine blocked from the from the car bomb had gone past us as well. Um, and we just you know quick, very quick contact report straight in there. Um, um, and the shock of the moment is it's your friends. And uh, we were looking over the flyover at this, this Land Cruiser on its roof in flames and the, the ammunition in John and Nick's pouches was, was all just self-detonating through the heat, you know, uh, and there's just, I mean, there's no way that anyone was going to get out of it. And just landing upside down on its roof would have, would, have, would have killed them anyway, but the blast would have killed them first. Landing upside down on its roof would have double killed them plus, plus everything else, you know. Um, I sort of hope the, the families aren't watching this, by the way, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it was tragic. Really, really, really tragic as it would be, uh, to, you know, to watch your friends killed that way. Uh, especially knowing, for anybody who might have ever known Johnny Dolman, a fighting man through and through, um, if he'd had his choice, it wouldn't have been to die that way. It would have been to die fighting somebody, you know, face to face, rifle for mm-hmm. rifle, in a, in a proper contact, not just being blown up. You know, how, um, how do you re- recover them and the vehicle? If you're a private well, company, um, the, the American military do 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 come to your aid, and they did. You know, I mean, um, we'd sent a contract report. Um, there's about ten minutes, and some Humvees did come out of the, the international zone. It wasn't that far away; it was about two k's away. All right, and they escorted us back in again. All right, after that, the military, the American military, do get on board and recover it all back. Um, what happens after that? Well, the vehicle scrap. All right, but then you've got to go through all of the um, uh, like anybody dying in any country affected, the whole thing went back to the coroner's court back here in the UK. It was, you know, someone, some, you know, British people and uh, Americans as well, actually, was killed. And therefore, you've got to go through the formal legal progress, uh, process of establishing the cause of death. All right, because it's a legal requirement to do so, even though it's quite obvious. You know, uh, I mean, to make it doubly sad, Tracy, perhaps she didn't need to go to the airport that day, but she, she wanted to do to sort out some, some flight tickets for some of her her um, office staff who were due to go back on leave. Uh, John Erdley, um, Scotsman, really nice guy. He'd been out of the country for, for six months away doing, I'm not sure, some, you know, personal with his family or something like that. This was his first day back and that was the first journey back and, then he, and he was killed. You know, um, yeah. 
you know, that's the flip side, Chris. There's no such thing as a free lunch, and, and that definitely wasn't. Right. Yes. Nick, tell us, um, can you tell us a bit about the anti-poaching stuff, your experience of, of that? Yes, yeah. Um, that was more so I was in the British Army, actually. Uh, and it wasn't a British Army gig either, you know, to, to be quite clear to anybody who's watching. Um, I'd, I'd met um, a young officer who I still know now, actually, Wayne. He came from uh, Malawi. His father, who was a businessman out there, ran the J&B Distillery to care for the rare programme, as it was then. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and they, what they'd done is organised to get, um, or to re-establish Black Rhino um into malawi so lewande national park which is about three hours out of bland tire for anybody who might know malawi a little bit um they put a compound in there uh let's say compound had a fence line of about 16 kilometers circumference inside the the national park uh and with a lot of liaison with south africa national parks and, and kruger uh they got two black rhino male and female uh and inserted them into this rhino compound to try and establish a uh, new breeding herd, which they successfully did. Um, Matt Hanning, a friend of mine, um, and I, we, we'd spoken to this, this, uh, this officer. Uh, he said, look, you know, if, if you want, you can go out. Said, we'd, we'd love to, because I always wanted to go to Africa. Um, so on the strength of a fax and, and a letter, there's no emails in mid-90s, not that I had anyway. We both packed a rucksack each, all right, headed for, for Gatwick, all right, uh, and on Saturday morning, we just left Gatwick for a country we'd never been to with a rucksack and a passport and some cash. Um, and when we got to um, to uh, Malawi, we were collected at a, a Lilongwe, all right, taken about four hours south to Blantyre, uh, met some people for, for a, a bit of a, uh, a welcome, how do you do? Got some provisions, um, taken out into the National Park on the Monday, and we were given... Uh, a small campsite which consisted of uh, what you and I would know as two nine by nine tents or something similar, uh, two camp cots. Um, there's a little catering um, tent facility thing there with a gas cooker and a gas bottle. Um, uh, Dennis said to us, look guys, well, there'll be a guy will come across the river every morning, all right, and he'll sweep away the leaves to keep the snakes away and he'll empty the, or he'll fill the water pots up for you. If you could go and find the fence line because we got some some Malawians who were cutting all the elephant grass down to stop it, the, the electric fence shorting out. If you can G them along and just supervise them, that would be great. Someone will be out to visit you at some stage in the next two days. Got to go because it's getting dark. And he went. So effectively, on Saturday morning, we were at Gatwick with a rucksack. All right, and by Monday afternoon, we were stood next to River Shiri in the middle of a national park in Malawi. And there was no one else there, apart from crocodiles and hippo and, and stuff like that, is it? So um, we got to know two of these Malawian game scouts who um, who uh, had to go into the compound, this, this large area, every day and trap these two rhino down. So we went in there with them, so we'd like to see the two rhino. Now, the elephant grass is very long. It's about seven, eight feet high for anybody who's not pictured elephant grass. You're just literally walking around in, in very tall grass. And um, first occasion, they got bitten by tetsy flies. All right, I spent about an hour in there, didn't find anything. So we came back out, went back in the day later. Uh, there were five of us all together. I was at the back of the queue. And um, we were sort of following one behind the other in the, in the tall elephant grass. And the, the whole queue came to a halt. And I was sort of looking over the top, trying to see what was going on. And then all of a sudden, everyone just bomb burst. All right? And there's this snorting noise, like a, like a racehorse at full gallop. And it's a bloody rhino. All right? And it's heading straight in our direction. Now, rhinos haven't got very good eyesight. They're really, really good hearing, a good sense of smell. All right? This rhino zoomed in on the group of us. They'd all scattered and it just left me stood there at the back and giving what the bloody like, rhino. All right. So I just, I just ran as well. All right. And I think with everyone disappearing in different directions, the rhino didn't know what to do. All right. And he just came grinding to a halt. We got chased twice that day by the same rhino. Now, for anybody who's not lived, all right, get chased by a rhino. All right. And you'll, you'll soon appreciate your life and you know how quickly a human being can bloody move as well. You know, um, but in amongst all that, there was the, the, uh, anti-poaching against the rhino but there was the anti-poaching that went on in the, the greater national park and that was organized or the anti-poaching by a fellow called mike who's a uh, south african um, army officer uh retired um 
the poaching in the Lewandi National Park wasn't too bad. It wasn't after the big game. It was actually more like villagers who were just after meat to look after themselves. So sometimes when you hear about poaching, you've got to take a very objective view as to why people are doing it. Um, and you could sort of understand it. That said, the game scouts would go out there, they'd still shoot it, and they had a uh, uh, AR-15 uh, assault rifles, you know. The bullets would go flying around. And we went on a couple of patrols, actually, all right, with these guys, and, and yeah, they, things kicked off, and the ammunition was flying through the grass. It was, it was, it was quite hair-raising, actually. Uh, but that's, when you look at the big poaching that goes on Africa, with uh, a lot of its Chinese back, and there's some big money in there and stuff like that. I mean, that's wicked, wicked, wicked evil. That's for money. That's people who are paying a lot of money because they want powdered rhino horn or, or something bizarre like that. That's not people that are looking after the feed themselves, Chris. That is proper international poaching. I've got no time for it. I've got no time for it whatsoever. And if I could take, take part in that, I bloody well would do. I really, really would. You know. But fascinating place. All right. Brilliant place. I went back again, actually. Uh, and Matt was supposed to go and backed out at the last minute. So I ended up ultimately sleeping in this national park on my own. All right. And it's the most oddest thing in the world to A, to have to sleep on your own, because most of us sleep with them. We've got the military, we were mates or, or something like that, or you're at home or whatever. You know, we don't tend to sleep actually on our own, but to sleep on your own, like in a national park full of leopards and snakes and all sorts of other stuff. All right, uh, Todd, you don't sleep, to be honest. All right, it's a, it's a very scratchy existence. Uh, I spent about 10 days out there, second time around, um, chasing these rhino around while they were getting uh, darted and things cuts in their ears so they could be identified through through binoculars by the um by the uh the staff brilliant brilliant place malawi lovely country uh, for anybody who's not been to africa before um go to the east or, or southern africa uh that's where all the game is it's it's fascinating and it's brilliant but the whole lot is blighted by poaching and the money that's involved with it yeah so i once went on safari in mozambique and <clears throat> the uh the fighters in the civil war had eaten everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they do. That's, that's why you, if you've got a West Africa, anybody ever had head, heads up, there's, there's no animals there. It's all gone. You know, uh, I think central Africa, central African Republic, a uh, place like that, Congo, what you supposed to call Zaire, democratic Rep Republic of Congo, a lot of wildlife, Uganda and things like that, you know, but, but not in the West. A lot, a lot of it has suddenly gone. It's, it's not the massive big game herds uh, that it might once have been. Um, I suppose we've got to be thankful that people had the foresight to start up with big game parks, you know, the, the big national parks and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, I grew up on Tarzan and yeah, it was, God, even as kids, you believe that all those animals existed in that, quant that massive quantity, you know, herds of wildebeest and, and, um, zebras and crocodiles everywhere but it it really is quite yeah limited in reality yeah another the rhino things happened that, that second trip where they wanted to to literally cut chunks out of the rhino's ears you know big v-shaped notches in the ears so they could see with the binoculars um very very interesting thing to get involved in actually because what they did they got um uh it's an alouette a bit like a gazelle from um, south africa national parks uh with a vet um <clears throat> they'd go and track down the rhino, uh, as you can in a helicopter, um, follow the rhino, because obviously the rhino would then start to go on the run with the noise of the helicopter. Uh, so they track the rhino, and as the thing, the whole situation stabilised a wee bit, then the, the, the vet leading out of the helicopter would, would shoot the rhino uh, with a tranquilizer, And it would take an amount of time for the tranquilizer to take effect, but eventually the rhino would slow down and then just keel over. Now, that's the equivalent of doing a 400 meter race and then just falling over at the end of it. You've still got all that latent heat in your body, but you're not moving anymore to get rid of the, of the heat. And the rhino can very quickly overheat and die because it's metabolism. And so I can't get rid of all that heat because it's just become unconscious at the, uh, down on the ground. So what we had to do was then run through the bush. We had some land rovers. We had to run through the bush with the 25 liter cans of water. And then the helicopter would land. The vet would do the thing in the ears. And we would then literally be pouring water over this, this hot rhino, which is a, a big steaming lump of, of rhino, emptying water all over it to, keep, to cool it down, to keep it cool while the vet was doing his job. And then the last thing we'd do, he would then give it a, an injection to, to 
um, to avoid the effect of the anaesthetic, we'd all hightail it pretty quick. The rhino would then sort of get up and shake it around and crikey, what was that all about? And then go thundering off through the bush. You know, but it was it was brilliant to be involved in. You know, um, a couple of that many people have actually been ended up laid flat out over the top of a damp, damp, hot, steaming rhino. All right, but it was it was pretty good, mm. pretty good. You know, get involved for the for the people who have thought so. Get in touch with somebody. Get involved. Go and do it. Pay your own airfare. Get your own cash out. Get involved if you can. It's, it's the best thing you'll ever do. You know. Yes. Whenever I'm in Africa. <laughs> Someone always tends to fall in the river and then I have to dive in, swim and rescue them. And I usually get attacked by a crocodile. <coughs> so luckily I carry a knife and I, I stab the crocodile several times, rescue the person. And, um, oh, hang on. That's Tarzan, isn't it? <laughs> Tell you what, Chris. Yeah. Those, 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 those crocodiles that we used to see in the River Shiri every day, they were huge. You know, I mean, I know people think the crocodiles are big anyway, because they are, but they were massive. I mean, that river was so full of fish, right? because the staple diet really is, is, is fish on a day by day basis. So full of fish. I mean, those rhinos, I keep saying rhino, those crocodiles must have been, uh, I'm guessing like about three feet in diameter. Mm. Absolutely massive, mate. You know, but then of course you've got the hippo. Um, a lot of people um, don't really take into account hippo. Um, they cause a lot of fatalities in Africa. All right, I mean, in terms of being killed in Africa, road traffic accident or malaria from mosquito. All right, number number one and two effectively. Snake bite quite low down, being eaten by lions even lower. Uh, but being uh, attacked by hippo is is quite a, a common thing. All right, they are very very big animals. Uh, despite being vegetarian, they are incredibly um, ferocious, especially when you get two males fighting or a female looking out for its calf. Now, bearing in mind they spend all the time in the water, you might not even see the calf or be aware of something going on. But if you're on the water on a boat and there's hippo around, it can be a potentially very bad place to be. All right, they are very, very, very ferocious indeed, actually. You know. yeah, and everyone gets lulled into a false sense of security if they're our generation because we grew up on rainbow, didn't we? Yes, yeah. <laughs> George there was pretty harmless. Yeah, you see the real thing. You watch a couple of bulls fighting and you cannot imagine the amount of energy that's involved in that. You know, they'll, they'll bite a man in half, mate. You know, well, incredible. When I worked in Mozambique, in the centre of Nikala, which was the nearest town to where we were in the, in the bush, <clears> there <throat> was a, a fenced, well, like a fence cage um, about the size of a, a, half the size of a squash court, you could say. Uh -huh. And in it was an enormous crocodile. It had been there since the Portuguese left because these things grow, live quite some years from what yeah, I yeah. understand. Uh -huh. And I'm guessing what would have happened is back in the, days of colonialism this would have been a feature in the center of town this oh. you know a swimming pool with a baby crocodile in it or a juvenile crocodile and um of course fast forward all these years the thing is still there oh. and it's surrounded not just by just covered in junk like a rubbish tip but everyone would throw cats and dogs over over the fence for this thing to why you know, throw the stray cats and dogs over yeah why that's that's bad yeah well that's the sort sort of job that someone like steve Irwin would have gone and rescued it wouldn't he uh, absolutely indeed One of these kind of rescue yeah. pro programs um yeah i'll tell you a bit about, about crocodiles in malawi and it wasn't just malawi but the um uh local people there they're incredibly superstitious, very much so. And even sort of, you know, quite modern day educated people still have this superstition thing going on in the background. We all do. I mean, Kaiki, who likes Friday the 13th, for example? You know, I mean, it's supposed to be first more hyper educated people and stuff, you know. Um, but they're, they're very um, um, influenced by uh, a lot of these superstitions. Right? And a lot of Africans believe that crocodiles don't eat people. All right. That was certainly the belief in Malawi. 
uh, amongst an awful lot of people because you'd see villagers up to their waist in water at the side of the river fishing with all these crocodiles going past. All right, it's the most bizarre thing to go and see. So I, I made inquiry about it. What's this all about? Because you know we've all seen David Attenborough movies with, with, with huge crocodiles sort of dragging all sorts of very large animals under the water and things like that. Um, and the answer is, yeah, yeah, crocodiles don't eat people. Witches turn themselves to look like crocodiles and they eat people. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's a very fatalistic approach, which is a sort of a bit of a military approach in some respects, because we, we're quite fatalistic about all that stuff. All right, but they genuinely believed, all right, that it was a normal everyday crocodile, we wouldn't touch them. And oddly enough, quite often they didn't either. All right, mm. but if they did get eaten or someone did get eaten, there was nothing that could have been done about it because it was a witch. And I, I guess you not, that was, was the belief, all right? Um, and on, on one occasion, we... Um, I so was a poacher. He wasn't doing, doing any much. He'd been poaching for sort of you know small bits and pieces. But he had a, a dugout canoe. Uh, so Mike said to Matt and I, "Can you take the the boat? We had a little uh, an outboard, uh, sorry, an inboard uh, motorboat, which we managed to get going. Can you take a couple of the game scouts and the poacher and an axe, all right, and get this guy to go and smash up his own boat so he can't continue poaching? So off we disappeared up the river Shiri, past all the, the hippo and all the rest of it." And we got to this big reed bed next to the side of the river. So the riverbank was actually 100 yards away, but then had all these floating reeds everywhere. So we beached this, this boat on these, on these floating reeds. And we got out, um, and the two game scouts along this poacher then went through the reeds for about, I don't know, about 10 yards, or, and then walked into the water again, and they're now waist deep, chest deep in water, with these AR-15 rifles above their heads and this poacher with an axe. So I said, right, guys, hang on it, stop, stop, stop. You know, um, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're going to take this guy to chop his boat up. I said, yeah, but you're in the water. You're up to your waist, up to your chest. You know, there's crocodiles everywhere. And they said, no, 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 it's, it's not a problem, Mr. Nick. You know, uh, we do this all the time. And I'm thinking, but in all the movies I see, people get eaten left, right, and center by crocodiles. They certainly would not be walking around like water. So they said, all right, Mr. Nick, we'll, we'll, we understand your concern, so we'll do you a favor. And they fitted their bayonets to the rifles. And went, there you go. All right, and they went. I thought, I'm having none of that. I'm just going to stay here on, on, on top of these reeds. So even that was floating on water with, with, uh, with Matt. We just stayed there and we just waited. We watched them from a distance hacking this boat up with an axe, you know, uh, and then sinking it. And they, they let the poacher go and they came back and we all got on the boat and went. So, you know, very different way of thinking, Chris. Yeah, so witch doctors get taken very seriously. In, uh... Yeah, it's, it's, it's genuine. It's, it's, it's genuine, you know. Um, mm. But you know, people might smile and stuff like that. But you know, you go back to what I was saying just now about Friday the thirteenth and stuff like that. We, we've, we're all of us got some sort of superstition going on somewhere. Look at sailors, for example, Matt Lowe's. You know, uh, there's always a superstition going on somewhere, and they're just more influenced by by it than we are. That's all. Yes, we can draw comparisons. Um, we still live in a society that believes you 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 catch the bogeyman from other people and yeah that's uh yeah yeah well yeah <laughs> we could we could go on a better stop there can we talk about cars that can go 200 miles an hour yeah absolutely indeed all right um you gotta fast forward the clock a week actually um i'll give you the background to it 2015 decided to extract out of the middle east i pulled the plug um came back to norfolk where i live now um Got a job, it was all right, uh, didn't really suit me, um, gave it up because I believe if you're not enjoying something, just pick it into touch and walk away from it, so, so I did. Uh, and then a friend of mine, all right, um, said, uh, phoned me up, he said, I've got two tickets to the tank museum in Dorset. You're an ex-tanky, could you show me around? I'd like to look around with someone who knows what they're talking about. All right, a bit tongue in cheek, I'm not convinced I was that bloke, but anyway. So we disappeared off down the tank museum in Dorset. Uh, we also got into the, the um, in the camp down there with some, some old friends of mine, got him into a challenge or two. Uh, I mean, you know, basically entertained him for a day and actually taught him about armour, armoured warfare and stuff like that. And um, he then went, we both went back our separate ways and he went back to work. And uh, his boss, when he got to work, because he was used to do all these factory tours, showing people around the, the factory, you see. And his boss said, look, um, you're getting busy. We need someone else to come and help you show all these VIPs around the factory. And he said, can you think of anybody? And he said, uh, 
He said, actually, I've just been shown around the tank museum in Bovington by this, this friend of mine, all right, uh, and he's really good, all right, and I don't know my people saying that, but and he, you know, really good time down there, all right. I would like to recommend him for the job, all right, because you can talk about tanks, you can talk about cars, you can get her a factory. Uh, so I got pulled in for an interview, so I went down there with a, a proper suit on and looking very smart and things like that. I got interviewed by Mel, uh, and um, subsequently got the job, you see. So along with Steve, this former friend of mine, we were then all right, um, until more recent times, what was called um, Senior Product Specialist for Aston Martin, all right? And it was just phenomenal, all right? And and all this technical understanding of, of Chief and Challenger battle tanks, of V12 engines, turbochargers, David Brown gearboxes, suspension systems, and, and all this sort of stuff, that formed the underpinning for taking people around the factory and explaining all right, how you build a 200 mile an hour sports car all right, and why it's built the way that it is you know um and the people that i met chris was absolutely phenomenal now, i can't name names obviously or anyone expect me to um but I'm, i met the most phenomenal people some of them incredibly incredibly wealthy um members of royal families and things like that other people were just people who'd saved up all their life and have got one aston martin because believe me there's a lot of people out there who've got more than one all right and they've got three or four or five or six and some Lamborghinis and all the rest of it, okay? Um, all of them, all right, to a man, to a woman, the most enjoyable, phenomenal people, you see. Now, a car factory for anybody who hasn't been there, all right, I mean, you start off with a load of bits of extruded aluminium, all right, um, you bond them together with glue, all right, so like Lotus cars are, for example, all right, Aston Martins and some other smaller manufacturers, they're all held together by glue that's then put into an oven, all right? So you'd heat the whole up to 200 degrees C in an oven for about two hours, all right? And the whole lot is then set like concrete, all right? Then you put your body panels on, then you paint the body panels, put that empty shell, painted empty shell onto an assembly line. It goes round the assembly line and collects all the different bits that it needs. Part of that assembly line sub-process is another bit called powertrains that build a go-kart. And it literally, as you look at it, it means a go-kart. So you've got this big V12 engine at the front, Okay, all right, with the radiator pack and all that sort of stuff and the front wheels and the brakes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, a thing down the middle called a torque tube, which is a casting about back that round out of aluminium with a carbon fiber prop shaft down to the middle. And at the back end, you've got the gearbox and the differential. It's all to do with balance and what they call a low polar moment of inertia and stuff like that. With all the rear suspension and the brakes, you've got the go-kart. All right, they, they, they get the go-kart that come around on a trolley. And then the car comes around on the assembly line like that and they lower it down on top and then do the bolts up. All right, if I remember rightly, something like 18 bolts, I think, to bolt the whole lot together, then all the rest of the systems, and the car carries on being built, you see. Meanwhile, the seats and the dashboard have all been built by, by uh, more craftspeople, um, girls on sewing machines, guys building seats, dashboards, leather from Bridge of Weir up in Renfrewshire, um, up near Glasgow, for example. I mean, the badges, for example, beautiful enamel badges built by Vortons in Birmingham. They're, they're a jewellery company. Um, up in Burma, look them up, some of these Wartons, all right, proper enamel badges. So you, you end up at the space of what would have been probably about 10 days from memories, just like all trickles its way around, right, from being a load of extruded bits of aluminium to a 200 mile an hour plus car, all right. To give you an idea about the 200 mile an hour bit, all right, um, if anybody might be slightly in this mathematical way of thinking, all right, drag, all right, increases with speed exponentially, all right. So Nor to 60 miles an hour, not much drag really. Although you try opening your driver's door, you're driving, I don't recommend it on a public road, by the way. All right, you can feel the force of the wind trying to keep the door closed, all right. Up to 150 miles an hour, all right. Um, Aerodynamics, quite serious to the extent that when you get to 150, most manufacturers stop there, all right. The problem is the curve of the bonnet and the curve of the roof are the same shape as an aeroplane wing. And the faster you go, the more the car wants to lift off the road. So it's going to be a hell of a lot of really serious, clever design, which you don't tend to notice, apart from the fact the car looks very pretty. A lot of design work goes in there to making sure the car stays down on the ground. And when you get above 150, those aerodynamic forces and that want to lift off the road becomes incredibly serious. And just look at Audi at the Le Mans 24 hours. Get someone look it up on, on YouTube. You'll see an Audi car lift off the road. It, it lost the aerodynamic force to keep it on the ground. All right, and it left the road, all right? Um, we still got low polar moment of inertia. Won't go into it too much, but for example, a BBS Superleggera at 211 miles an hour, 
has got the same amount of kinetic energy as a Challenger 2 battle tank at 35 miles an hour. That's how much energy is in that car. That's why you've got big brakes. That's why you've got to have good handling and stuff like that. You know, it's serious, but I'll tell you what, it's good. It's really good. You know, so I've got to drive a car once a month, but we keep your hand in. So to take a DBS or a Vantage uh, or a DB11 out um, for an afternoon, for an evening, go and visit some friends, uh, have a beer, not in the car, um, and drive back. You know, uh, and some of the gigs and the events that we, we got involved in was absolutely second to none. Um, from memory, in terms of some of the people that, that I showed around, Chris, um, two spring to mind. One was a lady that was blind. You know, how do you show someone around a car factory who's blind? You know, uh, and you really have to change your way of thinking. And it's, especially when we talk normally, we talk about, can you see this? Let's go and have a look at that. And all of a sudden you realise you can't. Uh, you can't see this. You can't go and have a look at that. You know, so we went around the factory um, for about two hours and got more involved in touch. All right, and we can feel the shapes of things and things like that. All right? She had an incredible sense of smell, an incredible sense of hearing. All right, but she got lost very quickly because it's like wandering around the woods in the dark. You know, uh, I take my hat off to her. She she stayed with it. Uh, quite a remarkable woman. All right. Um, another one I remember is a, is a family um, with two small boys who were probably about ten years of age. One of them is dying. All right, uh, had a terminal terminal illness. So what they were doing was was collecting memories. All right, so that when the, the young lad uh, you know, did, did suddenly unfortunately die, which was it was going to happen, they had a whole pile of memories. All right, um, and that was probably one of the most humbling tours around that faction that I did. All right, mm-hmm. someone who I knew was going to die. All right, young lad, age about 10 years of age. You know, and it's surprising what rabbits you can pull out of hats and, and things that you can do to, to make sure that someone just goes away with that wow experience. You know, probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life working in that factory. Um, I'm about to repeat the same thing with somebody else very soon, but I can't go into that right now. Can you tell us what's the connection with the James Bond films? How did how did that come about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> it goes back to kind of the year now. So Doc, Dr. No, for all the Bond affectionados, I mean, Dr. No had come out. Um, then we're going to into Goldfinger. All right. Everyone remembers the, the song by Shirley Bassey. All right. Um, Eon Productions, uh, Albert Broccoli had gone, I believe they went to Jaguar, you know. In fact, they went to Bentley, first of all, as the story goes, and said, um, we're doing these, these movies, all right, uh, about, um, about this guy, all right, and um, the original books by Ian Fleming said, you know, Bentley, could we borrow Bentley? So they said, well, what's this guy called? This um, He's called James Bond. And they went, all right, okay, uh, by Ian Fleming. No, I've not heard of him. Uh, right, okay. What does this guy, James Bond, do? And uh, Albert Brock, he said he's a spy. And Bentley went, well, I don't know, I'm sure about that. Um, it's not the sort of underhand sort of thing that we want associated with Bentley cars. So uh, actually, we'd rather not. No, you can't have one. So this is how the story goes. So then he went to, um, Albert Brockley went to, to Jaguar. Uh, Jaguar at the time had an awful lot of um, very, very busy place um, trying to build enough cars to fulfill orders. All right. Uh, and this was going to be a major distraction to them. All right, and they didn't have a spare car anyway because they were all the custom order stuff. Um, they said, no, absolutely no way. Uh, I haven't got time for that sort of stuff. Um, go and have a chat with a fellow called David Brown. He's got a little company called Aston Martin. All right, so they went to David Brown. Now, David Brown, Yorkshireman, said, uh, explained the whole story. So, look, you know, can we have, uh, can we have one or two cars? Um, and being a Yorkshireman, we wouldn't give away anything for free. So, well, I'm not going to give you a car. He said, but I'll tell you, what, I'll, I'll loan you one or two. Right, but you've got to give them back afterwards, all right? And it actually was a very late model DB4, right, just before it became DB5 in 1963, all right? Um, so that was the beginning of how um, Aston Martin uh, and, um, and James Bond got together, all right? After that, it all becomes a bit history. There was an interim period, of course, where uh, Eon decided to use uh, other marks of car. Uh, but then if you go back to... 2002, the launch of the Vanquish, as it was then. All right, Eon took Aston Martin back on side again, and the rest as it goes history. All right, was, uh, wasn't it BMW in one of the films? Of- yeah, that, that was engine period. But what, what actually happened was, if you if you think about it, Chris, is, is uh, um, when you're getting product placement in a, in a, in a movie, um, people want the latest, obviously, but they want it to be different from the last time. All right, you can't have the same Sony Vio laptop over and over again or the same Amiga watch or 
or so on and so on. It's going to be different from the last time. Okay. Um, and over that, those intermediate years through the, through the 80s, the, the shape of an Aston Martin really didn't change significantly. So it would have been like the same car again and again. Uh, I mean, the one that cropped up was on, I think it was called uh, To Live or to Let Die, the Timothy Dalton film where they used an Aston Martin Vantage with the skis on it and the rocket out the back. Right. Well, that shape of car remained like that for decades, which is when you started to get these other car manufacturers being invited. But when the Vanquish came out, bingo. Right. They weren't going to use a DB7, actually, but Aston Martin went, oh, hang on a minute, we've got another car we've been working on. Come and have a look at some of this. So it was the Vanquish that got it all back together again. Um, it's a very good relationship. Um, I, I know the lady who uh, was in charge of that the relationship between the factory uh, and Eon. Um, both incredible, incredible brands out on the world stage. Both got their most incredible history, all right, and uh, such a fascinating history together. All right, brilliant company, Eon. I've not met any of them, but I know people have lovely, lovely people. All right, and then tied up with the, the marketing guys and all the rest back at Aston Martin as well. Very, very good relationship, actually. Yeah, and I'm guessing now that we've given the company some exposure, I'll be um, claiming my my free vehicle. <laughs> absolutely, indeed. Be nice, wouldn't it? Be absolutely nice. The, uh, some of the people used to get a, get a vehicle, and again, were what was, uh, a lot you, Chris, called influencers, uh, bloggers, for example, all right, who had such a massive, 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 massive audience. They used to get given a car for a while. You know, they had audiences in the millions and, and stuff like that, you know. Um, I can't always say it was successful. Um, I don't know how many bloggers out there had audiences who, could, who wanted to afford an Aston Martin, but but yeah, the, the theory is there, effectively. All right. Stunning place. Brilliant British mark of motor cars. Not the only one. Uh, a brilliant mark of motor car. Incredibly proud of my time there. What a machine or group of machines are uh, fascinating, brilliant, brilliant place to have worked. I loved it. Nick, on that note, um, can I just thank you massively for coming and sharing your stories? Of course. Yes. Yeah. I've got a feeling we've got a few more in there. We can uh, eke out of you at, at another point. Yep. Absolutely. Indeed. Pleasure. Absolutely. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's been like for all the audience. You know, me sat here in this armchair at home sort of thing. I don't know whether I'm, I'm saying is anything is particularly interested in anybody or not, to be honest. Um, but I've certainly enjoyed it. You know, it's, it's been a good time so far. Yes, I've enjoyed it. And that's the main thing. Mm, all right. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> Sorry. Did that, Chris, did that lot hit the right note, did it? Uh, yes, I'm just going to say goodbye to our wonderful friends at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, it did. It hit exactly the right note. It's all all the reasons why I started a podcast, Nick, was to have these chats that you don't normally get sat behind a computer uh, in your in your daily life. So thank you ever so much. Pleasure. And to yeah. everyone at home, if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. Thank you for joining us again on Bought the T-Shirt podcast. Look after each other and we'll see you soon. Well, take care, Chris. Take care, everybody.